Well, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Veterans for Peace and all of the other organizations that came together to sponsor my coming here. Uh, it is a real tribute to your uh, interest in a very important thing that's going on right now in the world that you've come in, in large numbers and to be here tonight to talk about the issue of Gaza, Palestinian issues in the West Bank, Gaza, uh, Israeli policies, and American policies uh, on the Middle East. Well, what happened to me? Why, why was I there? I was uh, uh, on the Gaza flotilla because I had been involved with uh, trying to get groups into Gaza for the, for the last year. Ever since the 22-day uh, uh, Israeli attack on Gaza that started in December of 2008 and continued into 2009, that resulted in the deaths of 1,440 people, uh, over 5,000 wounded in Gaza, 50,000 made homeless, um, a huge amount of the infrastructure of Gaza being destroyed. Um, I was, as a military officer, I was uh, very disturbed by the pictures that I saw coming out of Gaza uh, during that time. So disturbed that I thought, I, I want to go see for myself. I want to go and see if I can get into Gaza. Because it seemed to me like the disproportionate use of force by the Israeli military was um, something that as a military officer I, I felt was um, uh, bordering on the criminal activity. And that's despite the fact that the Israeli government was concerned. They had concerns about their own national security that I certainly acknowledge that indeed there have been thousands of rockets, homemade, unguided rockets that have been sent from, from Gaza by militant groups into Israel. And there were towns along the border that were living in fear because they didn't know when these rockets were coming. They didn't know if the rockets were going to hit the town. Uh, the little town, the little village of Sidorot that's right on the border has uh, air raid shelters uh, that people can move into as soon as they hear a, a sound, a whistle that says that a, a rocket has been detected coming from Gaza. And in the past six years, there have been Israelis that have been killed by those rockets. Uh, over 30 people by Israeli human rights groups, estimates, have been killed in, in those rocket attacks. I, I don't condone the rocket attacks at all. But I can on one level understand the frustration of a lot of the 1.5 million people that live in Gaza, that little place called the Gaza Strip, which really is a strip, 25 miles long, 5 miles wide, 1.5 million people living in that small area, one of the most densely populated areas in the world, and an area where people of Gaza have not been able to freely leave the country, leave that area. Uh, where family members have not been able to go back into Gaza to see their families. And in fact, I know that we have some Palestinians here and at least one person from Gaza. Would you, who, who is from Gaza, would you stand up? I mean, how long has it been since you've seen people from your family? Six years. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's a remarkable story of people who are really in an open-air prison who have not been able to leave that prison because of the policies of the Israeli government and the Egyptian government and the American government and governments of the European Union countries, all of which have come together to say to the people of Gaza, um, we are going to keep you in that prison until you renounce a government that you've democratically elected, and that is the government of Hamas. The Hamas political party, economic party, militant party that was elected by the people of Gaza in 2006 and took over in 2007. Um, it's another one of those things where the, the international community decides that it will use blockades, quarantine, sanctions on people to affect change. Uh, and it's not the first time that this has happened, of course. I mean, how long has the United States had its blockade on Cuba? I mean, 60 years, and gosh, did that work? No. Who's still in power? The Castro brothers. We had a 12-year blockade, siege, quarantine on Iraq. Did that work? 
No, Saddam Hussein was still in power. Um, mainly because these blockades and sieges don't affect the, um, the political leadership, it affects the common person. And usually common people who are having difficult living without uh, enough food, without merchandise, without whatever it is, um, they're the ones least likely to take up weapons they don't have uh, to go after a government that, in the case of, of um, Gaza, that they elected. So the whole idea that these blockades, these sieges, these quarantines uh, are going to have any other effect than just being brutal and mean to average citizens is something I think we as citizens always need to keep in mind. And whenever our governments come up with another time that we're going to put quarantines, where we're going to put sanctions on people, let's, let's think about who it really affects. And you know, the latest one that the United States is doing is of course on Iran. That one more time, another sanctions to stir up the people of Iran so they will take up arms against the revolutionary government and overthrow it so the United States and Gosh, what are we supposed to be doing if the people of Iran take up those arms? I mean, all of these questions that we have about these policies that are so destructive to the people. Well, I went to Gaza in late January of 2009 to see for myself. I was one of the few people that were, being, were, were able to get into Gaza in late January. There were thousands of people lined up at the Rafah Egypt gate trying to get in. I and Medea Benjamin and Ty Berry of Code Pink Women for Peace, the three of us had flown to Cairo, then taken, taken uh, uh, vans to get to the border, and not knowing whether or not we would get in. And indeed, the thousands of people that were there that didn't get in, we still can't figure out why the three of us were able to get in. The, the Egyptians, when they finally let us in, said, you have 48 hours in Gaza. We're going to close the borders after 48 hours, and we don't know when we're going to reopen them. And, they, and it was true. 48 hours later, the border closed, and it did not reopen for over 20 days that nothing was coming through. No humanitarian goods, no humanitarian assistance. And that was after that 22-day uh, attack on Gaza. What we saw there stunned us. It really did. I mean, the is for over 50,000 people gone in smithereens. I would show you my pictures of it, but they're on my computer that the Israelis have. Um, the pictures, though, that you all have seen, the pictures that just show devastation in the northern part of Gaza, uh, the virtually every industry, every commercial area uh, gone, all of the construction businesses gone. Um, I was I was so stunned that I mentioned to Medea and Tig, I think we need to we need to take groups in here. Let's see if we can't bring a group to Gaza. And six weeks later we had sixty-five people that from ten countries around the world had said we want to go. And in March of two thousand nine we, we brought that group in as a part of International Women's Day. And then Two months later, in May of 2009, we brought another group in, and there were already four other groups, and we had, we had assisted in helping get in, and in fact, uh, Susan Johnson was one part of one of them out of New York. Four more groups that were in Gaza at that same time. And then we thought, well, what? There's so much interest. People wanted to see what it is, what's going on, and come back and tell their communities. So we decided we would organize what was called the Gaza Freedom March. And over the next six months, in an internet plea to the world of come to Gaza, come in solidarity with the people of Gaza on, to, to commemorate that, that date a year ago that the Israelis started bombing, attacking Gaza, stand in solidarity in a march with the people of Gaza. And over 1,350 people said, yes, we'll go, from 55 countries. And a thousand people came to Cairo 